ranked as the most corrupt Southeast Asian country, Cambodia is about to have an election. But with the main opposition party banned from participating, it's being widely condemned as a sham. Not that you'll read that in the local press. The country's head of taxation has been accused of forcing the closure of independent media. But what has he got to hide? I don't want to talk about it. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode, 101 East investigates Cambodia's brutal crackdown in the lead up to the national election. It's Monday morning in the Cambodian People's Party headquarters in the capital Phnom Penh. Having ruled the country for more than three decades, the party's propaganda machine is well oiled. Spokesman Sokazan is presenting his program, True Voices for People, live on Facebook and on 17 government-owned radio stations across the country. Except those with an opposing opinion. In the past five years, as support for the main opposition party surged, the world's longest serving Prime Minister, Hun Sen, launched a brutal campaign against it. Opposition politicians have been beaten, more than a dozen jailed, the party's leader held indefinitely on treason charges, and then the final blow. Nine months before the election, the party was outlawed for conspiring with the United States to overthrow the government. Meet Pix Ross. He's been accused of acting for the ruling party when he filed a complaint against the opposition that led to its demise. I complain them because they are act opposite the law. His evidence? A 2013 video of the former opposition leader, Kem Sakar. <laughs> That is, show him uh, under USA government. If the politician in Cambodia under other country, it's wrong, opposite of the law in Cambodia. <laughs> Pix Ross is now leading the campaign for his own Cambodian Youth Party, one of the 20 mostly new parties contesting the July 29 election. <laughs> but once again, he finds himself fending off accusations. He and his party are puppets of Hun Sen. <laughs> And he insists it's his own money behind his party. I sell my land, I sell my house, I sell my car. Just before I have a good cars and comfortable cars. But for now I use the old car and near maybe niche this ring. <laughs> Cambodia is a failing democracy. We are a one-party state. Nali Pilorj is the director of one of Cambodia's oldest and most respected human rights organizations, Likkado. If you look closely at some of these parties, the other 19, except for one tiny one, they're all aligned in some ways and they all popped up recently. So this is not a multi-party um, election. This is uh, a non-competitive election. The one and only party that Nali Pilorj says is independent is this one, the
the Grassroots Democratic Party, set up in 2015. Today its candidates are meeting on the outskirts of Phnom Penh to talk election strategy. Sang Koma is a party founder and its prime ministerial candidate. The portrait of his party's co-founder is an eerie reminder of just how treacherous Cambodian politics can be. In July 2016, Kem Le was shot dead in a Phnom Penh cafe. One of the country's most fearless critics of the ruling party, he's widely believed to have been a victim of a political assassination. A lot of people try to convince me, to warn me that, to be careful. I say, well, no, no, I, I know what I'm doing. So to me, it's, I have no choice. I have to continue this mission. Like the people they hope to represent, most of the candidates have little money. And with the campaign budget coming out of their pockets, funds are limited. So saying Comer's encouraging party members to be creative, like recording policy messages for Facebook. So we have thousands of people are doing like that. Okay. Excellent. So it's like grassroots media. Yeah, yeah, sure. When there's no independent media. Yeah, yeah. We have to find alternative. We have to find a way out. <laughs> for what? <laughs> it's not only the main political opposition party that's been destroyed in the lead up to the election. The independent media has been decimated too. The alleged new weapon, taxation. Last September, after 24 years in operation, one of the country's most fearless newspapers, the Cambodia Daily, was forced to shut down when it received a tax bill of $6.3 million. Its final headline pulled no punches. The Cambodia Daily's former manager, Douglas Steele, and owner-publisher, Deborah Krisha Steele, are currently living in Tokyo. Back in Cambodia, they both face criminal charges for tax evasion, carrying a prison sentence of up to six years. They chose essentially a number that was unpayable and were very hardline about that. Yeah, Steele vehemently denies evading tax, but concedes the company may have owed the department some money. The whole country is coming into the, the tax system. Most businesses are still not registered. You're going from a 0% compliance to a normal system, and we were moving along in that process. We got singled out because they didn't like us. Your Excellency, Mary Ann Jolly from Al Jazeera. The Thank man who's overseeing the tax reforms is Vibol Kong, today. the Director General of the Taxation Department. A member of the ruling party's elite central committee, today we meet him in his palatial office on the top floor of the department. We have done a tremendous reform uh, on the revenue because the government realised that uh, for the country to move forward, for the development of the country, we need revenue to expand. Babol Kong refutes accusations his department has targeted independent media. I think uh, that statement is not true, it's uh, false. But some people would say that it's an amazing coincidence that four of the only independent news organisations in this country received very large tax bills. It's not true. Regardless of independent newspaper or not independent newspaper, they are subject to the rule of law here. That's my role here. The United States government isn't convinced. In January, it withdrew funding from the tax department, citing concerns about anti-democratic behavior. Cambodia Daily, when they receive a tax bill, they jump to talk to diplomatics, to the embassy, to international community, 
by discrediting the government that the government target them. But actually, we are not targeting anybody. What about 10,000 of other companies in which we are auditing? They never complain anything. Why only Cambodia Daily? But a search of the Cambodian company registry reveals Verbal Kong's family appears to own a very large business and may have some questions to answer. One of the biggest petroleum companies in the country, it was incorporated in 2008, but according to the records here, it didn't register with the tax department until March 2017, the same time as the Cambodia Daily. It says on the company register that it only registered for taxation in 2017. I don't know you, what you're talking about. I'm just trying to understand um, whether perhaps your own family company has been audited to determine tax owed prior to when it registered with the department in 2017. No, it's not true. It has been registered a long time ago. So that date on the official Cambodia company registry is wrong? Wrong. Okay. Maybe they put in the system uh, wrong. When I mention the company registry also shows that two directors and a chairwoman, or relatives, live at his home address, it seems those records are wrong too. You talk about to the wrong person. Uh, I think I have nothing related to this company. But they share a home address with you? No, I think long time ago. Uh, but I got nothing to do with that. But that, those details are on the um, com Cambodian company registry that's now online, which has been newly put online. Yeah, but uh, I think it's wrong. It's wrong? Yeah, it's wrong. Right. So your family has no association with no. that company anymore? No. We sold a long time ago. I think uh, maybe they used my address before, but they never been. And I don't know when they sold. Right. Yeah. If that isn't actually their place of residence, it would raise real questions about what kind of arrangements have been made with regard to this company. What is his interest in the company? Is he in some way profiting from the benefits of the company in a way that is not transparent? It might be completely legitimate, but it is raising red flags that are worthy of questioning and investigation. Um, company in Australia, he's a soldier. Mark Zernzak is one of Australia's leading anti-money laundering experts. He finds it extraordinary that Verbal Kong's family wouldn't have updated the registry if the company had been sold. Normally there would be an obligation to update the registry to accurately reflect who the new owners are. You wouldn't still allow yourself to be listed as the owner because you're carrying liabilities for the operations of that company. Verbal Kong has financial questions to answer in Australia too. In Cambodia, his official salary is less than $1,000 a month and he has no other known sources of income. But here in the southeastern city of Melbourne, he has millions of dollars worth of property and has established numerous companies. The company behind recent property purchases is Panarid Pty Limited, set up in 2011. Verbal Kong is the sole director. Under Australian corporate law, sole directors of companies must live in the country. This is the address Verbal Kong has given as his to the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. But having lived in Cambodia since 1993 and worked as a senior government official, he clearly doesn't reside here. It's of great concern here that we've got a senior foreign government official giving an address that does not appear to be his place of residence. That would be a breach of Australian corporations law um, if that is not his, his place of residence. So it, it's a huge red flag. I understand that you have several million dollars worth of property in Australia. How uh, have where, you where accumulated did, uh, that sort of wealth? Where did you get those information? From Australian records, publicly available records. I understand that you have a company called Panarid Pty Limited. It appears you have broken corporate law in Australia by registering a business and giving an Australian address when you actually live in Cambodia and are the head of the tax department here. I think uh, that business since I, before I start uh, working in Cambodia, long time ago, 
But no, I, I, it was actually registered um, not that long ago. I've got the company extract No, here. but I transfer to the, uh, the other person already. Maybe the record is not updated. So you don't really know no. anything about that yeah. company, Panarid Pty mm. Limited? Yes. It closed down a long time ago. Mm. Yeah, I got nothing to do with yeah. the, in Australia. Right. These companies have been... Mark Zernzak oh. believes Australia's corporate database oh, is accurate. He is the sole beneficiary of, of this company. He's the sole beneficial owner of this company. And for the company to keep going, someone's got to be paying a an annual registration fee to keep it registered here in Australia. So it, it, it stretches belief to think that he doesn't know this company exists. The Boa Kong's Australian business associates raise even more red flags. From 2006, he set up two investment companies and several trusts with an Australian-Cambodian couple who was soon after convicted of defrauding the Australian Tax Department of more than $1.8 million and suspected of laundering and hiding nearly $15 million. The Bol Kong denies knowing about the conviction or being in business with them. But you had businesses with him from around about 2006 and he was convicted and it made the newspapers I, in yes. Australia at the beginning of 2007. I was not aware of the, any because conviction. I told uh, the guy, don't involve anything with me at all because don't use my name and I, I never uh, get any interest out of that. So uh, I think uh, your information is wrong. So, so not no, involved no. in any businesses yes. with him, yes. even though Australian records show you yes, were. Yes, I'm not involved. So they're false. Yes. As is the Cambodia um, company registry. Yes. It's false about your family's company. Exactly. But 2013 Australian court documents reveal otherwise. He did even more business with the couple. Big business, transferring 1.2 million Australian dollars into an investment trust they'd set up. I can't remember that transaction, no. The money it's is a long lot time. of money. Yes, it's, it's long not time. every day you transfer yes, but 1.2 I cannot, million. Uh, I cannot remember that I uh, uh, transfer to uh, the, uh, that account, you know, because uh, somebody can use my name to do that. So even though your affidavit, signed affidavit, I believe witnessed by the Australian Embassy, clearly states that you transferred $1.2 million into the account, the when business account. When was it? Yeah. 2013. How do you get those information? Because It's freely available in Australia. We have access to court records. How have you managed to accumulate your wealth, given that you have no businesses in Cambodia under your name? I don't want to talk about it. Right. So this is a very large sum of money for a senior government official, which uh, appears quite disproportionate to that official's official level of salary. This should have set off a huge alarm bell as a potential risk for money laundering type activities or proceeds of crime type activity. What concerns me most is that how authorities seem to be turning a blind eye to all the activities which are happening. Kalyan Ki is part of Melbourne's large Cambodian community. She doesn't know the Bol Kong, but says other senior members of government and their families have made Melbourne a hotbed of illicit activity. The money laundering, the drug trafficking, for the human rights abuses, that happen and glaringly obvious and an open secret in the community. Until recently, she worked as an advisor to the Hun Sen government alongside the Prime Minister's son and heir apparent, Hun Manet. But says she stopped when she became disillusioned with the flagrant corruption of officials. The main figures in Cambodian politics at the moment has a connection to Australia. The richest man in Cambodia is also Australian. Um, so there's a lot of interest in ensuring that the Cambodian-Australian community remains with the current government because there's a lot, there's a lot of um, connections that is, is important and a lot of informal connections. What do you mean by informal activities? 
informal being as in it's illegal, it's kind of black market community. <laughs> Kalyan says the smuggling of luxury goods and cash, as well as drugs, is rife among the ruling party elite. And that government and military officials regularly transfer large sums of money to family or associates in Australia with few questions asked. Maybe to buy a house or a car, and the bank would just call up and say, where'd you get that money from? And then if you just answer, it's family money. Um, yeah, they don't follow it up. And in Australia, there are some very well-connected family members. Prime Minister Hun Sen's nephew, Hun To, is married to an Australian-Cambodian woman and is a regular visitor to Melbourne. While in town, he drives around in this Lamborghini with personalised number plates. Australian authorities reportedly suspect him of being involved in trafficking drugs. Everyone knows that what he's doing is not right. Um, they know where the money's coming from. Uh, they know all the human rights abuses. But we don't, we don't say much about it because um, I think people are a bit scared and concerned. Hun To doesn't have any property in his name but his wife has a multi-million dollar portfolio. Her most recent known property purchase is this land, bought for more than $800,000 with no mortgage. A luxury home is now being built. This motorbike importing business is owned by another member of Hun Sen's family, his son-in-law, Vichia D, who is head of the Cambodian Police Security Unit. On Australian company documents, he also falsely claims to live in Melbourne. If you were engaged in criminal activity, having a legitimate business that was doing importing is a great way to um, allow you to use your proceeds of, launder your proceeds of crime. And that does make it a challenge for law enforcement. Kalyan Key says she and others in her community have made complaints about the criminal activities of Cambodia's ruling elite in Australia. I have raised concerns with the Australian government, I've raised concerns with the Australian ambassador and the response is the same, like it's not a, our priority and this is not what we are here to do, so we're here to make good friendship with the Cambodian government. So what they're allowing them to do is, is have these informal illicit activities happen, so they are somewhat endorsing corruption. The Australian government refutes Kolyan Key's yeah. claims it condones illicit activities. Back in Cambodia, with the election imminent, the government crackdown continues. In the northwest province of Battambong, Sin Chan Poor Rosette is watching out for potential customers for her noodle restaurant. Just a year ago, she was on the hustings as an opposition party's candidate in the nationwide commune elections. Triumphant at the polls, she defeated the ruling party's commune chief, who'd been in the position for 15 years. But within just a few months, she was stripped of her victory. Rosette now relies on her restaurant to survive, having rejected pressure to defect to the government. And that wasn't the end of the pressure. 
đã nợ pe để chào thay nhau khăn ông dạ pe tham mây tham mây để cái chào cứ cái ông piu niu ở nhà thô ở sầm mặt tại cái mà khâu âm mơ nhom khơi ở sầm mặt tại cái class pe cặp phơi chỉ cắt một hàng nên khăn ông chỉ đục phe bầm phật bầm phơi đã ở bong bồn để quạt tròn mà tụt tụt tiến lên hiên châu sang ngã đại chi tiếp. But Rosette refuses to be scared or silenced. Khi ông tôi, khi ông ắt tự bảo cháu tên nữ đệ tía, rồi mùi thằng ngày nắng, nhóm nữ bà thang lụa nồng bật chốc, rồi mùi cả thằng ngày nắng, khi ông tự đào lên, rồi chăm ca chân nha chân nha. It's a risky statement in today's Cambodia, where anyone calling for a boycott is punished as a traitor. 25 years since the Paris Peace Agreement promised to bring democracy to Cambodia, the country is slipping further and further away from it.